Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Daily Briefing. Uh, I just want to make one quick uh, announcement at the top, and then happy to open up for your questions. I just wanted to point out a group of visitors we have in the back several rows of the briefing room. It's 14 undergraduate and graduate students and two professors from a university in Santiago, Chile, are visiting Washington, D.C. as part of a semester-long program on economic journalism. Um, I'm sorry if I just embarrassed all of you, uh, but I wanted to say welcome. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. I hope uh, this is enlightening and interesting. Uh, and with that, I will open it up. Deb, get us started. Uh, let's start with the shutdown. Um, mm -hmm. We have some congressional sources who are telling us that the magic number on the furloughs at state is 343, half of them being 179, being from OIG, the Office of Inspector General. Can you confirm those numbers for me? Well, I can say that uh, we currently have, I would say, hundreds of employees uh, furloughed. Uh, again, as we've said, it's a small number. We talked about that some are from the Office of the Inspector General, uh, some are from another office, as we've talked about uh, as well. And I would underscore that every day this goes on longer, uh, we risk having uh, that number go up to the thousands. Thankfully, we're not there yet. Uh, but every day this goes on longer, we get closer. So can you give us any, I'm sorry, just one quick follow-up. Um, can you tell us about any upcoming impacts that might happen, say, you know, later this week or next week if this thing drags on? I don't have a, a timeline. I think this is where Elise was about to go. I don't have a timeline for when uh, furloughs might happen. Uh, no additional steps to announce at this point. As we've said, we've sharply curtailed travel, uh, participation in conferences, uh, public participation in other events. Uh, that's happening, that's already started happening, it was happening last week, but nothing new on top of that to announce at this point. You were going to get us a list of some of the conferences that you... I think our folks are still working on that. I believe there was one that involved counterterrorism, uh, but I'm not, don't have all the details in front of me. I know they're still working on that, and hopefully we'll have that later Do you today. Know where it was? I, I don't have the details. I think they're still working on it. And one of the uh, mm -hmm. impacts has already felt on the uh, trade talks that were supposed to happen in... Um, Mm -hmm. Brussels. Does that, does that involve the State Department people as well, or was that purely a Treasury? Uh, I will double check on that. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, can we change the subject? Yes. Um, I want to ask about the Secretary's comments on Syria today. Mm -hmm. They were kind of unusually positive towards um, the Assad regime, and I think gave a little bit of credence to fears in the opposition that this cooperation with President Assad only gives him um, job security and makes and makes him less inclined to feel that he needs to go to Geneva and negotiate his own ouster. Well, let me say first that our position on the future of Bashar al-Assad has not changed. Our position on him is the same, that he's lost all legitimacy to lead Syria, uh, that we're working towards the Geneva II conference uh, that gets us to a place where both sides, by mutual consent, pick the transitional leadership of Syria. It's clear the opposition won't allow that. On the opposition side, uh, right now, Ambassador Ford is in Istanbul meeting with the opposition, including uh, members of the SMC, including General Idris. Uh, the meeting, I think, lasted for three and a half hours this weekend, was a very productive discussion. So we're continuing to work with the opposition, the SOC, and the SMC. Uh, but the fact is that our position on Assad hasn't changed. As we go through this process of destroying Syria's chemical weapons, the regime, or an eventual transitional government, will have the responsibility, some responsibilities, right, for allowing access uh, and assisting in the destruction uh, through allowing access and allowing inspectors. But our position on the fact that he must go has not changed, and this in no way is an indication that he can remain in power. But when you say that he's lost all legitimacy to mm -hmm. lead Syria, and then the secretary says the Assad regime deserves credit, that in fact does give them a bit of legitimacy. It doesn't at all. We've said from the beginning of the CW destruction process that the regime, or whoever's in power, right, eventually a transitional government, will have responsibilities as part of this process. But that does not confer political legitimacy on them uh, to lead their country going forward. Yes, Saeed? I just wanted to, to follow up, but, but you are not precluding the fact that uh, you do acknowledge that the Assad regime has been quite forthcoming and quite cooperative in the last couple of days in terms of destroying the chemical weapons, correct? Well, I, I'm not going to use those terms. What I will say is the fact that three weeks ago, and the Secretary said this, um, the Syrian regime didn't even acknowledge that it had chemical weapons, and now inspectors not only on the ground, but yesterday the OPCW announced that destruction had begun, is clearly a step in the right direction. Uh, but as the Secretary also said, uh, we're not going to vouch today for what happens a week or a month uh, down the road, and we have to continue to see forward 
progress in the destruction of these weapons. Okay, but the credit remains. I mean, he, the, the, like the secretary said, I mean, he gets credit for cooperating, he gets credit for allowing the inspectors in, for basically opening the doors for them. You, you do acknowledge that. What we've correct? said, Saeed, is that all sides here have responsibilities under the UN Security Council Resolution 2118, under the Geneva Framework, under OPCW Resolution. Uh, all sides have responsibilities here, and everybody is looking to the Syrians, to the UN, to, the, to everyone, uh, to live up to those responsibilities. Okay, I Syrians just want you seem yeah, to be yeah. meeting those responsibilities. We've said it's a step forward, but again, forward progress can, keeps having to be made in this process. If you just allow me I'll for go a to second, you, next, Joe. You, know, yeah. you know, just the broader picture. Mm -hmm. I mean, here the United States is involved in fighting Al-Qaeda in Somalia, in mm -hmm. fighting Al-Qaeda in Libya, and at the same time, Assad is fighting Al-Qaeda very bloodily, as a matter of fact, in Syria. Don't you find, like, you are both on the same side in this battle? I don't know in any way how those two are connected, Saeed. Do you, do you want to you play that a little more and you, I can respond? You don't believe that Assad is fighting the same kind of elements that are organizing in Somalia and, and, and in I Libya? think Bashar al-Assad has brutally killed over 100,000 right. of his own people. Mm -hmm. I think that's completely separate and apart from any legitimate counterterrorism operations or, or interests we might have elsewhere around the world. That's just offensive to actually put them in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a isn't there a, a dilemma that you have? Because I mean, realistically, forgetting about theories and who you know, there will eventually be a transition government. Mm -hmm. Right now, you need somebody to assure that those stockpiles are under lock and key, mm -hmm. that nobody's going to get them, et cetera. And that guy is Assad. Well, it's so, bigger than Assad, but, right? It's the regime. The regime. <laughs> let's and say, the, well, and the we use that. <laughs> but let's say right. the regime, mm -hmm. even more so. So. If you begin to dismantle that in this crucial time where you want to make sure that the chemical weapons really will not get out to anyone else, isn't it dangerous to uh, suddenly remove Assad from the picture or even the regime from the picture? Well, it, it's a good question. And what we've said is as we move towards a, a political transition, we actually don't want to dissemble the political and governmental structures of the entire regime f for exactly that reason and others, quite frankly, because we don't want to have complete political implosion in Syria. We need some political structure going forward for a democratic uh, transitional body or whatever we'll call it uh, to take to take uh, the lead there in the place of Assad. So there's a reason that we think it's important to keep some of those institutions intact. Uh, and, and it's uh, important for uh, the Assad regime uh, to maintain control of these weapons and to sh tell the inspectors where they are, to fully cooperate so we can, in fact, destroy all of them. So they don't fall into, you're absolutely right, we don't want them to fall into uh, unknown hands or terrorist hands, certainly. Okay, but to, and then to play that out a little bit more, mm -hmm. If you're looking for some sort of transitional government, you have to get to Geneva, too. Mm -hmm. And so far, listen to what Minister Lavrov said yesterday or today, mm -hmm. uh, that the opposition still are incapable of pulling it together in order to, you know, even get it to the <coughs> get to the table, he would argue. So what is your reaction to his criticism of the opposition? And um, is that a concern? Because, I mean, right now, you still have to deal with the regime, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that this crucial agreement is carried out. Well, absolutely right on the second part. We do have to, uh, the UN and the OPCW, I should say, have to deal with the regime in carrying out uh, the UN Security Council resolution. But in terms of Geneva II, uh, the topic of participation was discussed between the Secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, we didn't expect to resolve that question at this meeting. As we all know, it's been an ongoing question. Uh, we have seen the opposition take steps to unify. We've talked about a lot of them in this room, and I think you see uh, Ambassador Ford, again, having extensive meetings with them uh, in, in the region uh, right now to help them move forward in this process. So uh, we'll continue discussing participation. I know we've talked about possibly mid-November. Ban Ki-moon said that, and we've talked about that as a possible time frame, but we don't have any time frame yet. We want to make sure we have the right participants and the right uh, items on the agenda to make progress. Is it, was Just to follow up. Was there any progress made with come to you next. Ambassador Ford in the opposition? Does he feel yet that they have a cohesive delegation that they could bring to the uh, negotiating table in Geneva? 
Well, I, I think uh, we said for a long time that they've continued to get more cohesive. I mean, we haven't talked specifically about who will be at Geneva uh, when it comes to people, but we've said the SMC and the SOC will be the representative bodies representing the opposition. Uh, a couple, I have a little bit of a fuller readout of his meeting. They discussed in detail the situation on the ground and, in particular, the rising influence of extremist groups and how it could be slowed and ultimately contained. Ambassador Ford also pledged more uh, support to their organization. We've talked about this a lot. They also discussed humanitarian aid and all agreed that as a matter of principle, neither armed opposition groups nor the regime should block humanitarian aid deliveries. So th those discussions are ongoing. He's still, he's still in Istanbul. So we might have. U.S. officials have told us mm -hmm. as early as recently as last week at the United Nations that, or the week before, that the opposition is battling on two fronts. Not only are they battling the regime, but they're also battling extremists. Mm -hmm. So doesn't, when he says how, when the ambassador says, they, when you say they discussed how the rising influence of extremists can be contained, mm -hmm. doesn't that mean kind of on the battlefield as well? And wouldn't that include U.S. support for their efforts? Well, it, it covers the wide range of topics uh, when we're talking about extremist groups. Clearly, uh, this person that spoke to you at the U.N. Is, is correct in the fact that the opposition is fighting the regime. But we also do have extremist groups, particularly in certain areas. We've talked about al-Nusra. We've talked about ISIS who are not parts of the legitimate opposition and that we're all dealing with, right? Or we're all trying to contain. I shouldn't say dealing with that could, could be positive. That, now they're a, um, an element on the battlefield that that is, while you're helping the regime in terms of battling the Assad regime, don't you now, whether you're battling, helping the opposition battle the Assad regime, don't you also now have to help them battle extremists? Well, we're, I think, across the board helping them get stronger and represent the, as much of the opposition as possible, and that can include a lot of things, including, uh, yeah, I, I would say broadly speaking, we certainly don't want extremists to be a part of the opposition or to gain in strength, and we would support efforts so they couldn't. So can you tell us then if they discussed ways of, um, you know, controlling the influence or weakening the uh, extremist opposition, what are some of those ideas? How do you do it? It's a good question. I, let me see if I can get more detail uh, from the ambassador, from folks that were in the meeting. If we have some, some details to share, I'm happy to talk about that uh, tomorrow. I'll just see if I can get some more details from the folks right. on the ground. Mm -hmm. Secretary Kerry and uh, Minister Lavrov discussed the participation of Iran in Geneva too, and what do you have on this? Uh, they did, as I said, discuss participation. Uh, we've been clear. Uh, multiple times about Iran's destructive role in the Syrian crisis and our expectation that any party that's included in Geneva too must accept and publicly support the Geneva communique. Uh, if, and this is an if, uh, Iran were to endorse and embrace the Geneva communique publicly, uh, we would view the possibility of their participation more openly. Mm -hmm. it was not during the um meeting with Secretary Kerry. I believe it was. Let me double check with our folks on the ground. Just I believe it was, though. Clarification. Is that you're talking about Geneva One Communicate? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. But on, on this on this very issue, mm -hmm. the Syrians are, are not the Syrians. In fact, uh, a high-level American official is saying that uh, the government here missed an opportunity last year <laughs> to actually cut a deal uh, on the Geneva One, but because of the political, you know, uh, uh, climate at the time of the election, they missed that opportunity. Can you tell us anything about I that? I think what I would say, and I'm not exactly familiar with the specifics that you're referring to, Saeed, but I would say that everyone in this administration, uh, people who've served in it, people who currently serve in it, uh, very much want to get us to a political solution to the crisis in Syria. But it's really hard. If it were easy, it would have been done months ago. Uh, there are a lot of complicated factors at play here, and everyone in this administration is working towards the same goal. Uh, and if, you know, if we've had opportunities in the past that people uh, allege could have gotten us to a different place, I would, I would challenge them uh, to come out and say how, because we've been uh, going down every path uh, to try and get to a political transition as quickly as possible. Uh, but again, this is, we've always been clear that this will take time. Mm -hmm. Do you give any credit to the Syrian regime for its cooperation or not? Well, I think I answered that question a little bit, but I'm happy to go back but over it again. I didn't understand it very well. You, okay, so I'll try and make it more understandable. That I, I don't want to get into the, the term credit. I'm going to say that everyone has responsibilities here that Don't they have, the that they have. Of course, of course I do. Um, of course, absolutely, I stand by everything the secretary says. Uh, but when it comes to the responsibilities of all the parties here, the Syrian regime, who's in control of these weapons, has responsibilities. So we certainly say this is a step forward. Uh, that just yesterday the OPCW was able to start destroying part of its program. Uh, but it matters that we keep making progress. 
and uh, we want to uh, continue on the process. The OPCW and the UN are working very hard on it right now, and we hope to see more progress uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a, a follow up one uh, Said's so question, earlier question about the uh, uh, Assad regime is battling with the Al Qaeda. There are reports, for example, today from Time magazine that uh, actually uh, Assad regime is not bombing uh, the places such as Azaz by the border of Turkey or some of the northern Aleppo places that uh, I see uh, IS uh, controls. Uh, do you have any information to confirm that the Assad regime avoids bombing? bombing the, the uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates. I can uh, check places. on that. I don't know the answer to that. I can check on it. And second mm -hmm. question about the Kerry praises uh, uh, Assad. Uh, today, Turkish Prime Minister said, it's called, I cannot imagine a human uh, praise Assad after he killed 110,000 people. My first question is, do you have any reaction to this statement? Well, I don't think I would characterize uh, what Secretary Kerry said is praising Bashar al-Assad. Uh, we have been very clear from the president to the secretary to this podium that what Bashar al-Assad has done is horrific. He has no legitimacy. Uh, nobody is giving him any praise. Where we are today is in a situation that was unimaginable just three weeks ago, where we are undertaking a destruction of uh, Syria's massive chemical weapons stockpile. It is just a fact that the Assad regime is in control of those weapons. So it is a fact that the OPCW and the UN must work with them, and they have responsibilities to assist in the destruction of these weapons. That's just a fact. That's not conferring legitimacy. That's not giving praise. But uh, we want the process to keep moving forward, and when it does, we will say so. That's what the Secretary was doing in his press avail today. So do, but do you understand people uh, who, have, uh, who are outraged by this remark uh, when you compare Secretary Kerry uh, comparing Assad to Hitler a month ago, and now he praises, uh, says. Again, I'm going to take issue with the word praise, and I'm going to make it very clear that this administration, Secretary Kerry, all of our positions on Bashar al-Assad has not in any way changed, period, full stop, uh, from what we've been saying for uh, months, if not years now. Would you say that the uh, regime is meeting its responsibilities in this whole affair on chemical weapons? Well, what we've said is that w the past few days and, and, and week is what we've, we've called a step forward. So that's a good sign. Uh, but uh, as the Secretary said, more things have to happen and we're not going to vouch for what's going to happen tomorrow or a week from now. Uh, we need to keep seeing forward progress. I think another uh, milestone, I should say, that is coming up, and let me get this in front of me, is that um, on October 27th, uh, Syria's initial declaration to the OPCW of its chemical weapons holdings and facilities, and this is what's required under the Chemical Weapons Convention that they recently signed on to, uh, is due to the OPCW. So what we've seen so far have been disclosures. This is the first official declaration to the OPCW as part of their responsibilities under the Chemical Weapons Convention. That's October 27th. Uh, we'll evaluate and assess uh, information as it comes in before then, but certainly then after then as well. Okay. Next topic, or more on Syria? Are you still on Syria? Yeah, we'll um, or go ahead, Jill. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'm it's, not it's doing a good traffic comment but, today. Um, it, it, it now, let's say Iran, Syria, Russia. Okay. Um, it, I mean, <laughs> and then it, I'll come up to you after Iran, Iran, Syria, and Russia. Because it's okay. pretty obvious that the Russians are now using the uh, nascent rapprochement between the United States and Iran to take some hits against missile defense. And I know the Secretary was asked this question. Mm -hmm. Could you go into it a little bit more? I mean, is are we seeing any type of, um, let's put it positively, indication for the United States that uh, the threat from Iran might not be as great as the U.S. thought, hence missile defense might not be as important? Well, I think uh, it's a little too early to start making uh, those kinds of judgments about uh, the threat from Iran. We're at the beginning of a diplomatic process here. Uh, some of us will be in Geneva uh, very soon for the next round of the P5 plus one talks. Uh, we're just starting this, this uh, chance at a diplomatic opening that we saw at the UN, and, and we're going to see where it goes, because we all uh, would prefer that this be resolved diplomatically. Uh, on missile defense, we've been clear with uh, the Russians uh, that we want to continue the dialogue on it, that it's not uh, that they should uh, talk to us about it. We want to come to some agreement on what this could look like going forward, and we'll continue those discussions. This isn't a threatening 
move. Uh, we've said that repeatedly as well. So we'll continue the missile defense discussions with the Russians uh, and, and see where this process takes us uh, with the Iranians separate and apart from that. How do you respond to Foreign Minister Zarif's comments over the weekend in which he said that uh, now there's a whole new administration in Iran on the table, mm -hmm. the P5 um, should come forward with a whole new set of proposals, suggesting that the ones that, were, that remain on the table from Amalti are no longer valid. Well, uh, as we've said uh, previously, that the P5 plus one put on the table at Al Mahdi uh, a fair and balanced proposal, that proposal is still on the table. We have not, to this point, uh, gotten a substantive response back from the Iranian government. That's what we're still waiting for. So we hope that the new Iranian government will come to Geneva next week with a credible and a substantive response that shows they're ready to engage uh, in serious negotiations that will address uh, the international community's concerns. At this point, we have no plans to put on the table uh, a new proposal because, indeed, there's one on the table right now that they can and, and we expect and hope they will respond to. But it does sound like he's trying to change the ball game a bit well, I, to move the goalposts or whatever sporting analogy you want. You know? <laughs> I'll avoid sporting analogies, at least for right now. Yeah. Um, no, what we've said is, is what we said for a long time, that we'll keep talking about the proposal we have on the table. Uh, we're looking forward to the discussions in Geneva. Uh, I don't want to prejudge what those discussions might look like. Uh, but, I, again, no plans at this point to put any new proposal on the table because there's one on the table right now that they can respond to. And conversely, then, mm -hmm. since we're just reading between the lines of what you're saying, is you haven't actually received an Iranian offer yet ahead of Geneva because that was one of the mm -hmm. issues that Cathy Ashton had brought up, that she wanted a, something to be given to you in advance of actually getting to Geneva so well, you could study it. No, it's a good question. I think what we said after the P5 plus one meeting at the UN is that Foreign Minister Zarif put some ideas on the table. Uh, he, we heard him talk in a tone and with more uh, uh, specific, I guess, ideas than we had heard in the past uh, from previous Iranian administrations. But no substantive proposal or response from them yet to Al Mahdi. Uh, again, they could submit it before we get to Geneva. I know we've all talked about that. Kathy Ashton and others have talked about that. So nothing yet, but uh, we're all looking forward to meeting soon in Geneva. Yes, Iran, Iran. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to quickly follow up and ask um, mm -hmm. Minister Lavrov mentioned in his comments. Um, the meeting between President Obama and, and Putin that had been canceled on the 4th? Did they discuss, did Secretary Kerry and Lavrov discuss at all uh, arranging for another summit between the two presidents to take I place? I don't know the answer. I will look into it. Okay. I Do you know of any communication between the two sides about that topic? Or? I, I don't uh, know of any. Uh, I just don't have the facts, so let me check. Let okay, me thanks. Yep. Do you have any comment on uh, Foreign Minister Zarif's comment that uh, he felt that the president insulted the Iranian people? I haven't seen those comments. I well, he's responding to the president saying that Iran is working to have some sort of a nuclear weapon within a year. Again, I haven't seen those comments. What we've said, broadly speaking, is that uh, what we've seen from President Rouhani, from Foreign Minister Zarif over the past several weeks have been uh, hopeful uh, signs uh, and words that we hope will translate into actions. Uh, we had a productive meeting at the UN and again are looking forward to going into Geneva to continue work uh, on a possible diplomatic solution to this crisis. So, uh, is it hopeful enough to include them in a Geneva conference on Syria? I, I think I made very clear that if the Iranian government uh, were to embrace uh, the Geneva One communique that we would view their participation more openly, more favorably, but uh, nothing to announce on participation at this point. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask about the events of the weekend yes. in Somalia of and um, <clears throat> um, Libya? Mm -hmm. um, could you walk us through what you're able to give us and confirm perhaps some of the identities of the people involved and where they might now be and what the fate has been of these uh, the two people who were targeted? Yeah, well, let me make just a couple broad points and then I'll go into some specifics. I think uh, these two operations over the weekend underscore a few things about our ongoing counterterrorism operations. The first is that uh, we have a preference, when possible, to capture terrorists, uh, not just to take lethal action, uh, for a number of reasons, but including because of the uh, intelligence that's gained by doing so. Uh, second, that uh, the United States uh, doesn't forget when its citizens are killed, uh, injured, targeted by terrorists, even sometimes when it takes a while, uh, because these are tough targets to find, that we don't forget and we will continue to pursue justice and to take uh, terrorists who've harmed Americans off the battlefield. Uh, and third, that the United States military, our intelligence community, our national security agencies are able to operate globally with a global reach all around the world. 
uh, to go after terrorists who have either harmed or are targeting the United States right now. So I think those are some key sort of stepping back points about this. I'm happy to go through some of the details about some of them, or do you want to ask specific questions? Well, I mean, I think... Let's well, start with Libya, maybe. Libya, yes. Okay. So the gentleman, or whatever, um, <laughs> Abu, Abu Anas, Anas Alibi, Alibi mm -hmm. yes. So where is he right now? He's currently uh, lawfully being lawfully detained by the United States military in a secure location outside of Libya. I'm not going to give further details on his location. Well, the, I mean, you, you're obviously aware of the reports that he's on a, a ship and he's being interrogated. I, I'm not going to confirm any additional details one way or the other on his whereabouts. Um, Hold on, Saeed. I'll go to you. And where will he? I mean, once the interrogation assume is o is over, is the mm -hmm. intention to then transfer him to New York, where he's been indicted on charges? Well, it's it's true that he has been uh, indicted in the Southern District of New York in connection with his alleged role in Al Qaeda's conspiracy to kill U.S. nationals uh, and to conduct attacks against U.S. interests worldwide, which included Al Qaeda plots uh, to attack U.S. forces stationed in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Somalia as well as the U.S. embassies in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya. So, uh, again, that uh, the he's been indicted in the Southern District. I'm not going to give specific details about where he eventually will be brought, other than to say uh, that we, of course, are interested in seeking justice, uh, and he will uh, eventually be uh, subject to that process. I mean, is there any chance that he could be uh, end up in Guantanamo, or are you no longer transferring any No, our, our, the administration's position on Guantanamo is clear. Our goal is not to add to the population, it's to reduce it, which we've done. Uh, to get there, no, our policy is not to send any new uh, detainees to Guantanamo. Could you explain mm -hmm. to us what kind of uh, interrogation or questioning laws apply when this person is on a ship, perhaps in international waters? Uh, I'm not going to get into the details about uh, where he is right now or the situation. Uh, for any more specifics uh, on the operation or any of those details, I'd refer you to DOD, but I'm not going to get into any specifics in that regard, Saeed. Okay. Just a quick follow-up on the... Correct. Yes, he's in the custody of the U.S. military. Okay. Just a, a quick follow-up. Do you feel that you breached the sovereignty of Libya? No, uh, we don't. And I mm -hmm. would say a few points here about our relationship with the government of Libya. Uh, that we consult regularly with the Libyan government on a range of security and counterterrorism issues, and we're committed to doing so going forward. Uh, Libya is a partner uh, in fighting uh, shared challenges like uh, the terrorist threat uh, that men like this represent. Uh, we obviously aren't going to get into our specifics of our communications with the Libyan government, but we value our relationship. Uh, we support the aspirations of the Libyan people, and we will continue this uh, strategic partnership that's based on shared interests uh, and shared goals, certainly, of, of combating challenges like this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Libyans claim that you have not consulted with them, and they have a lot of questions about this. So are they saying this for, let's say, local co domestic consumption? Or are they telling the truth? I'm not going to get into more specifics about our diplomatic communications with the Libyan government. I'm just not. Uh, I'll again reiterate that, that we value them as a shared partner in this fight against uh, terrorists, wherever they may be. But I just don't have anything further for you on our communications. Okay. In the event that you did not consult with them beforehand, would that be a breach of their sovereignty that you so much Said I'm not going to address a hypothetical that I'm not confirming one way or the other. So is that a hypothetical? Is you said a hypothetical if. I didn't confirm whether. I didn't confirm anything. I'm not going to confirm anything about our communications with the Libyan government, and I'm not going to answer questions that are based on a premise of whether we did or didn't. I'm just not. Can you mm -hmm. say you do not breach the sovereignty, right? Yes, I say. Can you describe that a little bit more? I, I'm not going to go any further. I'm just going to say that we regularly consult with them. I'm just not going to get into the discussions we've had with them diplomatically. Uh, clearly, we value them as a partner in these efforts. And you say you said that he's being lawfully interrogated and lawfully held. Mm -hmm. Can you describe under what which law? He's yes, being held? Th this uh, was done under the authorization for mili for the use of military force from 2001, the AUMF from 2001. But this presumably applies to. Um, American soil and American citizens, doesn't it? What? I'm sorry. The, the law, the authorization 2001, would that not just apply, can it not just, I mean, it applies on American soil and to people who are here and Ameri American citizens. I don't understand how oh. it could apply to somebody who is a Libyan who's being held in international waters. I mean, if, if the British government decided to take, a, uh, you know, an American citizen in Libya, then you guys would not like that. I'm, I'm just trying to understand uh, how it can apply to somebody who's neither an American nor was he on American soil. Well, the authorization to use military force, and I'm not an attorney, so let's caveat what I'm about to say here, and our attorneys upstairs are probably screaming at their televisions. Um, but the authorization to use military force was about uh, 
going after terrorists who threatened to harm uh, or ha who had attacked or who were plotting attacks against the United States of America. So I think that he squarely falls into that category. Uh, again, I'm not going to do further legal analysis because I'm not an attorney. Uh, but he, ha again, has been indicted in the Southern District, including in connection with the two embassy bombings, which killed hundreds of people, including, of course, many Ken Kenyans and Tanzanians as well, not just Americans. Well, wouldn't it be, um, and excuse me for laboring a point, but no, you, okay. it seems like he was living fairly openly um, and assuming that the Libyan government were aware of his um, whereabouts, wouldn't it have been more... Um, uh, pertinent to have asked the Libyan authorities to have arrested him and then turned him over to you? I think uh, those are assumptions that uh, I'm not sure are true. I would caution anyone against making assumptions. These are uh, terrorists like uh, al Libby are guys who are trying to evade capture. They know uh, that they've done bad things, that they're bad guys, and that uh, they could possibly be captured. So uh, I would caution against some of those assumptions you just made. Living a normal life with his family going I'm back I'm not sure what evidence you have to support that. I'm not going to go into further details about what life oh. he was living before he was captured, but I would caution against making any assumptions unless you have uh, full knowledge about the situation on the ground, Saeed. I don't claim any full knowledge. Let me ask you this, mm -hmm. that uh, considering that this may be a very, uh, for sure, it was a delicate and critical operation, is it likely that you have had some help, intelligence help from the Libyans? I'm not going to go into any further detail about any of the intelligence. Uh, behind this, I will again say that we uh, value the partnership of the Libyan government, and going forward, uh, we'll continue uh, working with them on these shared challenges. Yes, Joe. Um, Marie, the secretary, when he was talking about this, I think yesterday, mm -hmm. said that um, this should send a message, uh, you know, that the U.S. is in there is still operating and mm -hmm. uh, will go to any lengths at any time to get people who carry out terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. Um, when we get into the timing of this, mm -hmm. was there an attempt by the administration to time this to prove that the United States is not deflected from its mission because of the shutdown? Uh, I would, uh, without speaking, of course, to operational details, strongly disagree with that characterization. Uh, operations like this uh, are undertaken at the best uh, time for operational reasons, period for no other considerations than for those. So any political considerations, quite frankly, don't and shouldn't go into the kind of calculation for timing of these kind of operations. Right, I'm not saying political. I'm saying, you know, the message from the United States government, which at this point, we've already talked about this, you've talked about it, uh, uh, ab around the world mm -hmm. is being uh, affected by the shutdown. It might be perceived by other countries that the U.S. can't um, function the way it normally does. The secretary is filling in for the president, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I know he he did go out of his way to say, you know, let this be a message that. Uh, so all I'm asking is yeah. not political. It's very much like a strategic U.S. Um, mission to right. prove that it's out there. Yeah. Well, I think uh, two points. The first is that the timing of these kind of military operations is only influenced by operational considerations. Without speaking too much for the Department of Defense, I will let them speak more about it. Uh, but that's the only consideration taken in, into uh, play here. But I think the Secretary was absolutely right that terrorists around the world uh, should understand that we have the ability and the will to go after them and find them and take them off the battlefield and bring them to justice if they've attacked our citizens or if they're trying to. I think that should be abundantly clear from what happened this weekend. I want to go back to Joe's point just for one second about where he eventually will be brought. I missed this in my book, but um, in terms of where he'll eventually be tried, um, the ultimate decision about whether and where to prosecute a suspected terrorist remains with the departments uh, authorized to carry out such prosecutions, which are DOJ and DOD. Uh, Article III courts, I know we've talked about that a little in here, have, have had a long track record of success, uh, but we also fully support the use of military commission system in appropriate cases, so don't have anything to announce on eventual trial, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of detail about some of the possibilities. What about the, excuse me, what about the other um, guy, Abdul Qadir? Do Mohammed we have anything else on Libya before yeah. we move on? Okay, yeah. then I'll move on to Somali, I promise. If yeah, we'll move on to Somali in one second. He's, Al-Libi's been called a significant capture by the administration. Is, is that consistent with the administration's view that Al-Qaeda is in, is in decline? Well, I think that you are grossly overgeneralizing and misrepresenting the administration's view on Al-Qaeda. Uh, what we've said repeatedly is that Al-Qaeda core in Afghanistan and Pakistan has been severely weakened because of our counterterrorism efforts. 
We have also said at the exact same time that as that core is weakened, we need to remain extra vigilant against Al Qaeda in Somalia, in Yemen, in North Africa, wherever they're plotting and planning around the world. Because we know as we decimate that core group, they try and go other places and strengthen there. So that's consistently been our assessment uh, for the last several years uh, and is certainly still our assessment today. I just wanted to follow up for clarity's on sake on, uh, on Joe's question earlier. Um, so is it, when we hear the phrase um, lawfully detained in mm -hmm. this case, we should interpret that as being under domestic U.S. law, not international law. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Okay. So can we talk about the, yes. other, the other guy in um, the... Mm -hmm. uh, it's, oh, oh, sorry, yes. Well, that's, sorry, that's okay. Um, but on back to AUMF, um, uh -huh. President Obama back in May said that... Um, mm -hmm he wanted to uh, revise and ultimately repeal the AUMF's mandate. So does that not complicate the justification that Secretary Kerry has put forward as how this was lawfully uh, undertaken? Well, it's not Secretary Kerry's justification. It's the administration, it's the justification that underpins the operation administration-wide. This isn't Secretary Kerry making a legal judgment. It's an administration judgment. And, and no, it doesn't. I mean, you, you referencing the NDU speech by President Obama, which laid out a path forward for our counterterrorism operations. This is certainly consistent with that, uh, with a lot of the principles laid out in that. I know discussions are ongoing uh, about AUMF and where we go from here, uh, but where we are today is where we are, and uh, this was a bad guy who needed to be taken off of the battlefield. Move on? Yeah, can we go to the, mm -hmm. to the other uh -huh. person? Yep. Who, um, whose whereabouts seems to be unknown, and if you can confirm his identity, which um, we have as Abdul Qadir, Mohammed Abdul Qadir, who is a Kenyan of, uh, or is a Kenyan of Somali origin. So we said uh, that the target was a senior al-Shabaab operative. I think I'll leave it to the Department of Defense to confirm the target of the operation specifically, as they, I think, are probably best positioned to do. And do you know what happened to him? Uh, I don't have any additional details for you on any of that. Because it seems to be an issue that he, he, it sounds like he could have been killed, but the operation had to be aborted before he could. Again, I would point you uh, to the Department of Defense for any of those details. Yes, Saeed. Yes, Palestinian Israeli. Oh, anything else on this? Oh, good. Just in general. I mean, the, yeah. the, the guy that you named the mm -hmm. the, the blacklist today for the um, mm -hmm. for Mohammed Jamal. Yes. Um, is the, is there? I, I mean, I saw the statement that you put out, mm -hmm. but there was um, a report at the back end of December um, linking him to the Benghazi attack, and I wondered if you could confirm or deny that to us. Uh, I've I've seen some of those reports. I don't have any additional information for you at this time. Obviously, uh, the Department of Justice is doing the investigation into the Benghazi attacks, and I would refer you there. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind who this. Uh, uh, guy is who was designated today, Muhammad Jamal and the Muhammad Jamal Network. Uh, they were both designated, especially designated global terrorists uh, today. Uh, Muhammad, Jamal, Muhammad Jamal, excuse me, became a top military commander and head of the operational wing of Egyptian Islamic Jihad, which was then headed by uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri. Uh, he's connected to al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, al-Qaeda senior leadership, and al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, he uh, was rearrested by Egyptian authorities in November 2012, and after his arrest, his confiscated, his confiscated computer contained letters to Zawahiri in which Jamal asked for assistance and also described MJN activities, including acquiring weapons, conducting terrorist training, and establishing terrorist groups in the Sinai. This is a group that operates primarily in Egypt, uh, but also in Libya. But you don't know, there's no, you don't have any direct knowledge of whether his group was included in or part I've of the I've seen some of those reports, and I just don't have anything to confirm that one way or the other. And he remains in, under arrest in Egypt? Correct. Yes. So he's been under arrest since, since 2012? He, I have here that he was arrested by the Egyptian authorities in November 2012, yes. Is there any reason that, well, now, the timing of the designation? Uh, not, not to my knowledge, no, these things are just a process that takes some time. That There's not, uh, to my knowledge, any specific reason we do these from time to time. Nationality? Mm -hmm. I believe he's Egyptian, but let me double check on that. Hold on, the see. release did not say. Well, then maybe I don't have it in this large book. Um, I believe he's Egyptian just because of his uh, uh, work with Egyptian Islamic Jihad, but let me double check on that. Okay. Most of their members are Egyptian. Okay, good. Move on to another topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Palestinian Israeli peace talks. Mm -hmm. First of all, could you update us on the status of the talks? I don't have any new updates for okay. you. Uh, this weekend, just this past weekend, uh, mm -hmm. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke at Bar. Line University, almost to the day, uh, four years after he spoke and gave a very hopeful speech back then about mm -hmm. the two-state solution. But yesterday, he said that unless the Palestinians recognize the Jewish state and give up on the right of return, there will not be 
piece. Do you concur with his judgment, with his assessment? Oh, excited! I'm not going to get into the specifics of the talk, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to I'm not going to parse what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said. Uh, what the president, our president Obama, said at the UN is that we will never compromise our commitment to Israel's security, yeah. nor our support for its existence as, in fact, a Jewish state. So, look, I'm not going to get into the details of the discussions. They're, they continue. They're ongoing. Uh, but I'm not going to go any further than that. So we're not talking about the security of Israel. because you the asked United about States Jewish state. Has, yeah. So, so, I, so you do expect the Palestinians to recognize Israel as that. a Jewish state. I'm not going to get in the specifics of the discussions, what's on the table, what's not. What's, I'm just not going to get into it. You can ask every day, but I'm not going to. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. And then, Scott, I'll go to you next. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you all have any comment or reaction to what President Karzai said today about the negotiations on the bilateral security agreement? And can you just characterize where we are with that, mm -hmm. with those negotiations? Well, I haven't actually seen that interview. I think it was a BBC interview with. Um, no, it was a press conference, I believe. Oh, a press conference. Yeah. Okay, I haven't seen the full comments, so I'll take a look at those. But in general, uh, work is ongoing on on concluding a, a BSA agreement with the Afghans. We believe it's important to conclude this agreement soon uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, U.S. and NATO planning needs to move forward. Uh, Afghan forces have also made great progress in improving their capabilities, but Afghanistan needs international support in building their forces that can defend the country and protect the population. So I think it's clear to us that Afghan leadership is focused on making sure that they have an agreement that addresses the security needs of the Afghan people. Uh, that's what we feel the BSA will actually deliver to Afghanistan, uh, a partnership that's cemented with this agreement. Uh, and I think that this would be clear and significant to the Afghan people. Again, work continues. Uh, but I will also say that we've made progress. Uh, but these kinds of negotiations are complex with any country, as we know, from sort of the technical to the tough security issues. And we always expected there would be sticking points and bumps in the road that needed to be resolved at a high level uh, at some point in the process. So that's continuing right Not now. Not enough to derail it. No. No. The talks continue. And do you think the discussions be, continue. And it could be done within the time frame it was supposed to be done, which would be? October 30. We've always said that October is a common goal uh, set out in the uh, SPA uh, and reaffirmed by both President Karzai and uh, President Obama in January, I believe. Uh, so we're prepared to conclude a reasonable BSA, and we're working towards that goal. Uh, after October, I think it becomes a little uh, bit more difficult, not, not necessarily uh, impossible by any means, but uh, Afghans will be focused on their upcoming elections. Yesterday we saw the lists closed for presidential candidates, uh, which, as we've said before, is very critical to, to Afghan stability, but we need to really be focused on this agreement and get it done soon. So are you nearly there, do you believe? Do you think you're nearly there? by an end of October deadline? I mean, I, I can certainly say that we've made progress and that the talks are continuing. I don't want to uh, prejudge the outcome because, as we said, these are very tricky issues. But I think uh, it's clear that the Afghan leadership is focused on this. We are certainly focused on it. And both of our governments committed to, to moving forward with it. So, so what Karza said today was that unless they get some dis, uh, agreements over these sovereignty issues, that there's not going to be a deal. Well, look, we've said that there were always going to be sticky issues in the process. It's a complicated agreement, but we're committed to working with uh, President Karzai, with the Afghan government, to conclude it as soon as possible. Yes, Scott. Elections in Azerbaijan on mm -hmm. Wednesday. Do you have anything to say about uh, this weekend? There's apparently been some arrests and some mm -hmm. intimidation of civil society types and independent media. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you're right. Uh, elections, I believe, are this Wednesday in Azerbaijan. And we continue to urge a free, fair, and transparent process leading up to and on Election Day. The United States <laughs> encourages the peaceful participation of all people in Azerbaijan in the election process and urges restraint and avoidance of violence or provocations by all before, during, and after Election Day. Uh, we also urge the authorities to protect the fundamental freedoms of expression, assembly, and association. Uh, like other friends of Azerbaijan and the international community, we were troubled by an attack on journalists, a group of journalists, I think, on October 4th. Uh, and after the election, the United States will be issuing a statement on its assessment of the electoral process. So I think we'll probably have that sometime later this week. Is it your assessment that the government is uh, properly guaranteeing those freedoms? 
Well, I think we've seen a couple reports on this. I think one came out from the OSCE uh, just recently about some of the issues involved with human rights in this election. I think that report, report objectively reflected the positive and negative aspects of the campaign period. There have been some of each. So we continue to urge the authorities to make sure going forward uh, that they protect these fundamental freedoms of expression, uh, assembly, and association. Would you have a on the ground? Uh, I can find out. I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Alan, you come up here. On um, the uh, U.S. Federation, Soccer Federation has invited Iran to a friendly game in advance of the World Cup. Does the State Department have any reaction to, to that? And, I haven't and seen that, that, but I guess what I'll say is we've always said we were open to direct negotiations and talks with the Iranians, so where better place than on the soccer field, right? I haven't seen yeah. that, but thank you for the question, though. Yes. Just one quick question on Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, last week you were asked about the uh, new Turkish a decision to to get the Chinese air defense, and you said that you you are talking to uh, Turkey. Did mm -hmm. you have an update on, on that? Well, we have conveyed our serious concerns about the Turkish government's contract discussions with the U.S. sanctioned company for a missile defense system uh, that will not be interoperable with a, with NATO systems or collective defense capabilities. Uh, Secretary Kerry spoke to Foreign Minister Davitolo in New York at, at, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly regarding our concerns. Uh, the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, who I think you're all very familiar with, uh, also discussed this issue with senior Turkish officials, and our discussions on it will continue. Anything else? Thanks, guys.